Leslie was yelling at me. You kept me up all night. <laughs> well, that was a very down. nice, a very nice <laughs> interview with her. Oh, thank yeah, you. yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, that was like two hours. Yeah. Oh, oh by the way, uh, this is Think Tech. Just want to clarify that, and uh, it's uh, it's Creative Contributions, which is our show about people who write books and do works of art. And our guest today is uh, Sharon Hicks. She's an award-winning writer, and we're going to cover her book here, which was actually published in 2014. Am I right? 2012. 2012, whoop. <laughs> and uh, she is a recipient of the Outstanding Nonfiction Award for 2012 in Southern California Writers' Conference, okay, published by Abbott Press, available on Amazon. It's a really interesting book. And uh, the, the title, of course, can I read this on the air? <laughs> <laughs> how, do I, how do you grab a naked lady? And I cut to the chase. <laughs> And the answer at the very end of her book is, you don't. Yeah. You don't grab a naked lady. You can try blankets, as the security people often did, but it doesn't work. Right. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Sharon. Oh, thank you, Jay. It's wonderful to be here. Yeah. I appreciate it. It's great that you wrote this book. I mean, it's a, it's a memoir. It's autobiographical, of course. It's got a lot of details about your life and the life of your mother and your father and, and brother and other members. Mm -hmm. of your family and and it's um it's a statement of courage it's a statement of candor and i my own view of it is that's why it's uh, so popular it's been selling hither and yon and and people they, they can't resist it they all say it's a great read it's a quick read uh, it's a read that leaves you with a lot of lessons and i can tell you uh, that i had that experience myself well, thank you yeah. i appreciate that yeah so i guess uh why don't you describe your own self what this book is about, Sharon Hicks, Sharon L. Hicks, if you don't mind. <laughs> okay. um, this book is a memoir, but it's really a mother-daughter story. So when I was writing it, I was thought this is, I had a huge manuscript, like 600 pages, but then I re realized it was really a mother-daughter story. Growing up with my mother as a bipolar schizophrenic. And I always thought as a little girl that I was immune to that. My mother's sick. I'm perfect. I mean, I was perfect. My, my dad called me little princess. I was homecoming queen at Roosevelt. I mean, I'm perfect. I was also chosen most ideal of my class. I'm perfect. She's crazy. So I divided that up in my mind. And that's how I survived. I survived it, I think. And my dad was very strong. So when I was going to write this book, I thought, well, I'm just going to write her stories because she had amazing stories. But Sharon, you got to write a book. I said, okay. So I, I taped her. I sat down with the tape recorder. I sat down with her for oh, maybe five hours. I said, tell me your story. I had it all taped. And then uh, I started to write, and I thought, wait a minute. This is really about us. It's not her because I really can't get into her brain, but I could get into my brain when I write. So I wrote it from a daughter's perspective mm -hmm. instead yeah. of just writing her stories. Yeah. So when I wrote it as a daughter's perspective, it changed on me. And at the end, I, I grew to love her like I never had before. And I grew to appreciate what she went through. Well, let's, let me examine that, okay? Because okay. yeah, I, I like to drill down on so many things with you. Um, so this was a bath of cold water for you to find that, A, she was not mentally she had mental disease. And uh, I remember when you first become aware of that, it's an interesting point in the book, uh, where they took her away one night for, uh, uh, after a party that was very tumultuous, and she appeared uh, in negligee, mm -hmm. as I remember, and made all kinds Seafood, of raucous yeah. remarks. And they took her away. Your, your father caused that to happen. And when you learned, when they told you that they'd taken her away and that she was uh, sick and she had mental disease, you were elated to find out that she had a disease, because if she had a disease, then presumably with modern medicine, she would be cured from There was the an disease. answer, right. There was an answer to her behavior. Yeah. And I really got that. You know, she's, so then they take her, the, the doctor told me he came, came as, uh, well, nobody knew who he was. He came as a special guest. And when he came, and he took me next door, and he said, Sharon, there's, your mother's going to scream. She's, we're going to tie her down to a gurney. We're going to men are all being white. There's going to be an ambulance, and we're going to take her right off to Connelly. And I thought, oh my goodness! But then he said, she's sick. She's going to a hospital. So as a ten-year-old, I got that. 
-hmm. And that really mm -hmm. made me feel better, that yeah. there was an answer. Yeah. Uh, it struck me also that you're, you're smart and that you're a social person and that you can have relationships, um, you're, you're healthy in that mm -hmm. sense. But it must have worried you over the years that what was happening to your mother, because she was getting worse, would happen to you. Did you have that concern? You know, I didn't. But I talked to um, one producer who was interested in the book, and he just read the first seven pages, and he called me and said, Sharon, this is a movie, this is what we're going to do, blah, blah, blah. He said, I don't know if I can go there. He said, I never had children, because I was afraid I was going to pass it on. Mm. My brother never had children, because mm. he was afraid. But because of your first seven pages, I went back east and sat down with my dad and talked to him for the first time. Why did you marry your mother? When did you first know? He asked mm. her questions he never had before, and I thought, it made me feel so good that, that it helps somebody. Because um, he said he couldn't address it. Mm. This is a producer who did uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's a great comparison. <laughs> he couldn't put a mental illness. <laughs> he said, I took all my memories and just put it in the middle of the ocean. And I always thought I was different, that I was perfect, that I did everything right. And only, only when I was really honest and did the writing, I thought, I'm more like her than I thought. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that was kind of scary. Yeah. But I never thought I was going to get mentally ill. Yeah, interesting. But yeah. The, the other thing is that, you know, at, this is not static. It was never static. It was always changing. It changed her whole life, your lives mm -hmm. together. And she got worse. And uh, that must have given you some concern about where it would all go. And then I find it interesting that at the end you say you found over time that you loved her, mm -hmm. you know, more than you thought before. What, what was happening there? She was getting sicker and you were loving her more. Was that a, a dependency thing or what? Maybe it was the first time she had to depend on me because I was her guardian mm. of her property and person, mm. and I was a trustee. So all of a sudden, I'm in charge. Yeah. And I think there was a dependency. She acted like a little girl, like she wanted me to take care of her. So uh, there was that kind of feeling that she was incompetent. Oh, interesting. That's very yeah. interesting. Yeah. So let's talk about your father for a minute. We, we okay. got to put this in perspective. Your father was a famous man here in Hawaii. And in, in large part, this is a, a book about growing up in Hawaii, isn't it? Right. So tell us about your father and tell us about your growing up here. Well, and we came in 1950. My uncle had bought a lot of land in Aina Haina. Mm -hmm. I, I tell a real cute story about that. He was a policeman, 19 years old, and he's at Cal Cal Corner. And he's listening to another people, another booth, talking about Mr. Hind buying all this property in Aina Haina, and they're going to develop it. Oh, Hind, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, they yeah. Go, so they're going to go out and see Mr. Hind. So my uncle's listening to all this, but he beats them to it. <laughs> he gets the deal, <laughs> Mr. Hind. <laughs> then he didn't know what to do with it. So he calls my dad, who was a contractor in Hawaii and <clears throat> California, and we packed our bags fast and came. And we built most of the homes in Aina Haina. That's how it started. Yeah, and he had a special recipe which was just perfect for Hawaii in those days. Actually, it would be perfect for Hawaii in these <laughs> days too, let me add. Can you talk about that? Sure. Uh, when he built the homes in Aina Haina, he built another one in Wailaika Hollow for somebody with another contractor, and it went so bad, he went home and said, I'm not doing this anymore. You know, this is too much stress. And my mother said, you're in the wrong market. you got to right. go low cost. you got to do affordable, and this is what we're going to do. And my mother, would, she had these moments of brilliance, you know, and my dad said, okay, so they, he came up with, well, he was a marketing person. He came from May Company, and uh, now it's Macy's, May Company in lo downtown Los Angeles. He knew how to market. So what he wanted people to do is be able to go in Hicks Homes, look at a plan, and say, I want that house on my lot. No changes. Uh -huh. All the roofs were white because there were no changes, 100 homes a month. Uh -huh. And it was just a set plan. Uh -huh. And they couldn't make any changes, and they went it real fast, 100 homes a month. And, and it was, was relatively cheap. Yes. The first home was um, two-bedroom, one-bath at $4,000. If we could all go back <laughs> then. <laughs> <laughs> and he did have, it was single-wall redwood construction and oak floors, and there was not much change to it. So give us a precy of how it was when, you know, you came out here. And you found that your mother had a pretty serious mental disease and was walking around with a, on Kalani on the Only Highway with no clothes and a salad bowl right. on her head. 
you know, uh, how was life for you? And ultimately, you wound up as the person who was running Hicks Homes. Can you talk about how that happened? Well, I made up my mind as a little girl. I'm not going to be anything like her. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do nothing like her. So I decided, I don't know if this is chemical or what it is, maybe, but I just decided I'm not going to have moods like that. Mm -hmm. My kids are going to be able to trust me. They're going to be able to come home when I'm, I'm they're not going to find me naked painting their house. Or, I, I wanted them to be dependent on, that I would be dependable. So I kind of made up that mind and I took a path where I was going to be more independent than her. She, she could never hold a job. Mm. She, um, it, she couldn't because handle it. Because of the bizarre conduct. Yeah. yeah, well, she wouldn't take medication. So she never knew when she woke up what kind of mood she's going to be in. But at the time, there was medication that she yes. could have taken. Yes. Uh, I know she, she did electric uh, shock therapy for years and years. It may not be the best thing. I'm not mm -hmm. sure they do that anymore. Um, but they there do. was also medication, yeah. Right. So the medication, I don't know. I bet it's changed since the 1950s and mm -hmm. 40s. They made her feel awful. She would vomit. She would sit there and itch and scratch and scratch, and her legs would go like this, you know, and it just drove her crazy. So it was much more fun to be manic. She was, she was more manic than she was depressed. That means happy. Yeah, manic. I used to say hi, but that's a different connotation today. <laughs> In those days, they called it manic depressive. Okay. Today, they call it bipolar. Okay. <laughs> but that's what she was diagnosed with. Yeah. And it was hard. Medication was hard. I think she had it said she loved dark chocolate. So I remember at Liberty, one day she spent 17000 in one weekend. What on, on and what? Liberty House. So she went. She wanted to buy a particular bathing suit. So she bought it in a size, real big size, and it, she took a size down. The same bathing suit, a different, different size. And the guys were saying, salesman says, "Why are you buying so many sizes?" Just why I'm losing weight. You know, so she wanted, <laughs> she wanted a bathing suit. But she spent seventeen thousand not only at um, at uh, Liberty House, but also at. at uh, McInerney, Carol and Mary, all these old style stores on Drawage, she had all this merchandise. And so I went back to Liberty House because she had been at Kekele Wing at Queens, the psychiatry, psychiatry, psychiatric unit. Yeah. So I take all this merchan merchandise to Liberty House and I say, please can I return this? And the, the manager just looked at me and says, does she eat chocolate? And I says, what do you mean? He says, well, I have an auntie in Texas. Every time she has chocolate, she goes off. And I said, yeah, my mother's house was full of chocolate. Very interesting. Yeah, oh, she loved yeah. chocolate. So it's, to me, it was a chemical thing. She had very sensitive chemistry. She was yeah. vegetarian. Yeah. She yeah. didn't eat meat. Yeah. Uh, uh, did you take your bathing suits back? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I said, I don't want to <laughs> but that's a lot of money, you know, and I just yeah, I, I returned so. it all <laughs> with their medical bills. <laughs> so you, you became a, a parent to your mother over yeah, time. Yes. Yeah. You try to help her out of situations and make it right for her and protect her? It was so difficult because um, she was so unpredictable. Oh, there she is. She's so pretty. Yeah. Oh, there's a picture. Yeah. She's a very pretty woman. She was. And she looked so calm there in that picture. Right. But actually not. <laughs> <laughs> she was very musical. Uh -huh. So she'd sit down and play the piano. She could do anything. Good, good ear. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, one of our family members is a rock star. Uh, he started a group called The Sublime. And uh, that's a big musical group right now. But he passed away 20 years ago of an overdose. But our whole side of the family on my mother's side are very musical, yeah. good ears. And I took classical music. And I'd be playing something in, in the other end of the house. Sharon, you hit a wrong note. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know? oh, that, that tells you something about the yeah, she had pitch a perfect and tone. Ear. Yeah. Yeah. I just think she was extra sensitive. Yeah. Well, I, I, uh, I'm going to take a break now. Sharon, okay. Sharon L. Hicks. <laughs> <laughs> the author of How Do You Grab a Naked Lady, a very interesting memoir by Sharon uh, out of 2012, yeah. <laughs> published by Ambrose. It's, uh, it's uh, Abbott, rather, and it's on uh, Amazon. Um, you ought to take a look at it. We'll talk more about it right after this break. Hi, I'm Tim Apicella. I'm the host of Moving Hawaii Forward, 
a show dedicated to transportation issues and traffic issues here on Oahu. Uh, join us every other Tuesday at 12 noon and as we discuss how we try to solve our traffic headaches, not to, not to include just the rail, but transit and carpooling and everything in between. So join us every other Tuesday, moving Hawaii forward. Thank you. Hello, I'm Crystal from Quok Talk. I've got a new show here. You've got to tune in, check out my topics on sensitive, provocative female issues. So Tuesday mornings, 10 o'clock. Don't miss it. It's going to be fun and dangerous. Aloha, this is Kelihi Akina with the weekly Ehana Kako. Let's work together program on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network, Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. Movers and shakers and great ideas. Join us. We'll see you then. Aloha. Looking to energize your Friday afternoon? Tune in to Stand the Energy Man at 12 noon. Aloha Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. Bingo, we're back with Sharon. What does the L stand for? Lee. Okay. <laughs> I just started that when I put out my book because I, I Googled Sharon Hicks and there were too many of too them. Too many Hicks, okay. <laughs> I put an L there. But I mean, Sharon, Sharon grew up in Hawaii and she's a, a sort of a contemporary of mine, although we haven't known each other. We've only met her a few weeks ago. And uh, David, your older brother. Yes. And, and that's you. You were a beautiful child. Oh. Look at you. How old are you in that picture? I'm about three, and David was four years older. Seven. Yeah, and it was only a, a few years after that when all of this started happening. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, well, you had, you know, you had an interesting, when I say interesting, <laughs> an interesting childhood. And I, and I wonder um, how it changed you over time. How did it change you as a person? I mean, if your childhood had been less interesting, uh, how would your life have been different? I don't know how to answer mm -hmm. that. <laughs> I think I would have had uh, more self-esteem. Uh -huh. I probably would have gone after a career instead of marrying. You know, I went to college to get an MRS degree. Uh -huh. I married when I was 19. And I married somebody who was going to go to dental school. And it was just all a white picket fence. Everything's outlined for me. And, and uh, you know, and... I wasn't raised that way, but today's women, I just think it's fabulous. They can grow up to be anything they want. Mm -hmm. and, um, well, you, but you've demonstrated a fair amount of talent in business. You took over right. your father's business and managed right. to make it work for a long time. Yeah. Um, and other, you've been in, in your, you're the uh, executive director of the, uh, what is it? Uh, American Academy of Amer Pediatrics American in Academy Hawaii. American Academy of Pediatric Doctors. Yeah. That's, and that's a national organization. Yes, it is. You got to have some management skills to do that right. for sure. Right. I'm, I'm very well organized. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> and I, maybe I got that from writing the ten book. Year, and 10 years old, I'm doing the household stuff, you know. Yeah. In those days, they had the old washing machine that goes like this, and you put yeah. it in this thing, you go over here, and you put it through a ringer, and you yeah. go outside and hang it up. I did that. I was 10 years old. My mother's in Connie Hilly. Yeah. But I didn't think anything of it. Just you just did it. Yeah. But how did how did you deal with the um, you know the, the the kids in school, the neighbors, who knew what was going on with your mother? Well, interestingly, one girl knew, the other one was oblivious until she read the book. She, my next door neighbor was oblivious. She was I didn't know. The other the other girl she knew, she knew exactly what was going on, because she says her mother, and my dad were friends, but. My mother would chase my dad down the street with a broom after him, you know. <laughs> they would go out and help my dad. But it's interesting, and that's like David and I, my brother, I thought something was wrong. My brother thought she was just having fun. She was what? Just having fun. Well, that's what it sounds yeah. like in she parts just of the book. Fun. She's just, yeah, having, she's just fun, having fun. And, but maybe a little too much. And he was always so proud of her because she married when she was 16, had him when she was 18. She was one of the youngest mothers, and she was always out there, you know. Yeah. She just out, outrageous out there, and he always thought, that's my mother, yeah. you know. And to me, I was going, that's my mother. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But two children and one family, it's so interesting. How, how did your father deal with all this? He stayed with her. He took care of her. He tried his best. How mm -hmm. successful was he? Uh, well, he told me that she had an illness, and then it could be cancer. It could be heart. It could be anything, but hers happens to be in the brain and uh, he he's not you don't leave somebody for that mm -hmm. uh, he was very strong he was always loyal to her yes 
What a, what a great what a great guy. This was consistent with all of the qualities that he demonstrated in business, right? I and mean, he was really a tower of a he man. He was a he his your word was your bond. Mm -hmm. He even built an apartment building on a handshake. Can mm -hmm. you believe that? No mm -hmm. contract. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. you say something, you're going to do it. And yeah. That's that's the old style, huh? Old style. And that's mm -hmm. that's uh, fabulous. I know. So, can you find a a, uh, a provision, a, a paragraph, a passage that you like in the book, and that would you know personify at least how you feel about the book today. Well, it's kind of difficult. <laughs> it's that my mother was arrested over thirty-three times, mainly for not keeping her clothes on. She loved being naked. Mm -hmm. She said she had nothing to hide. She's a pretty woman. We just yeah. saw. She says, "I have nothing to hide." You know, it's only people running around with the clothes. And then she'd say something else too. If she think. God has a sense of humor. Look at the person next to you. <laughs> <laughs> she was always, you know, talking about people. But let me see. <laughs> um, I just don't know. I know you asked me this a long time ago. Okay. My dad liked to say, like my dad liked to tell me it was love at first sight. He was visiting his best friend, Louie, when he saw Mother sleeping on the living room couch. That couch was the only piece of furniture in their rented apartment. Grandmother Noel moved constantly, trying to find the cheapest apartment for her and her three youngest children of 12, Louis, Mother, and Ernie. It was 1933 and times were tough. The only work available for a single mother in Los Angeles was as a maid. Grandmother Noel scoured the morning papers for a cheaper apartment. Then when she found one, she piled the kids in the car and relocated. They moved 15 times in three years, oh, hence gosh. the dearth of furniture. It was easier to pick up and leave if they all, all they owned were the clothes. I'm going to marry your sister, Dad said that afternoon. Just like that. It was one of the things I admired most about my dad, the way he knew what he wanted, the way he wasn't afraid to snatch it up and make it his own. Whenever he told me this story, I thought of a sleeping beauty, only instead of a chaste little pecks on the cheeks or lips, Mother and Dad necked like crazy in the back of Louie's car, <laughs> much to the consternation of Louie's girlfriend. Anyway, I thought Dad the perfect Prince Charming with the way he rescued Mother from the life of poverty. She was 15 and Dad was 17. Yeah. They married the next year. But I sometimes wondered if she regretted getting married so young. Maybe if she had waited a few years, waited until she was a little older, waited a little longer to have kids to have me. Maybe everything would have been okay. <laughs> Who knows the answer to that? I eh? know they were so young. Now her her illness, uh, you know, put a lot of stress on you, and you wound up with two failed marriages. Do you think there's a relationship between the stress you had at home with your mother and the need you had to take care of her, and the and the failure of those marriages? Yes, but I didn't know that till I wrote the book. Mm. Oh, interesting. I never made a mistake. You had to understand, I didn't have failed marriages. Mm -hmm. well, okay. <laughs> so it was not part of my language. I'm going through all this stuff. Okay. And then I'm going, oh, wow. You know, I didn't, didn't pick right. And when they, they were both alcoholics, but I'm not you're supposed to use the word alcoholic. Uh, they both drank too much. Uh -huh. And I, I just, I guess I was raised in such an environment that I didn't know what was normal. Uh -huh. And I didn't really pick people that were compatible with me. Well, that makes me want to revisit the issue of when you started writing mm -hmm. and why you started writing and, and why it took you so long to actually, you know, close on the book. Um, because, I mean, writing is therapeutic. Everyone right. knows that. To write your own biography, to talk your own story. I mean, it's, it's the same thing as telling someone, mm -hmm. except maybe it's, you know, even greater power when you write it down to the written word. But why did you start writing? What made you do that? Were you seeking some kind of resolution of issues in your life that you started writing? I always knew I was going to write. Even in, when I was in college, I read a book by Albert Camus, The Stranger. And that, I said, that's my style. I'm going, to, I'm going to remember that. And all through my years, I just kept taking notes. I kept police records and everything. And then I thought, when I was 69 and she had passed away, I thought, I better do it. And I didn't know when I... Memorialize. No, I didn't. I was just going to write her stories because they were so fantastic. Yeah. I never heard stories like that. You yeah. know, I always had the best story at any party and everything. <laughs> no, nobody had a mother like me, right? So I was just going to write her stories, and I thought, wait a minute. Um, I didn't know I was going to write about me. 
Interesting. And so I learned so much about me. And I, did you find that while you were writing, when you started writing, or did it take a while? It took a while was, because I had to be honest. Yeah. Uh, so when I tell anybody about writing a book, especially a memoir, it should be written like a novel. You mm -hmm. should have all the whatever the problem is, and then it should escalate beyond control, and then you have to some kind of resolution. It has to be written like a novel, and the protagonist can't be perfect. I, I, I didn't know I wasn't perfect, but after I wrote it, I thought, wow, I'm not perfect. Mm -hmm. No wonder I do it this way. Uh -huh. Oh, wow. I learned a lot about yeah. myself. I didn't even know I was going to learn, yeah. but I had to be honest. And so you finished the book, and then you found that it was popular. Now, that's, that's more than you know, self-resolution. That's more than just tonic for you. Then you have the validation of knowing that a lot of people like this. They want this. They want the clarity. They want the candor. They want the honesty. Mm -hmm. what, what kind of reaction do you get from them, and what kind of reaction does that give you? Well, at first when it was published, I felt very naked. <laughs> oh my, it's out there. You know, it's like you can't bring it back. <laughs> it's out there. And I felt very naked in, in my, my being. And then things happened so fast. You yeah. know, people, uh, I had two movie options right away, and I, I got scared. I got this award, and all of a sudden I went like this. I thought, oh my gosh, now what do I do? It just kind of They hit know me. about Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But it was, a, it was a very good feeling to write it. Yeah. I spoke at the population at women's prison a couple of weeks, a, a month ago, and I, I didn't know how it was going to be. But when I started talking about being 10 years old and my mother being in prison or my mother being at, in the hospital, <clears throat> I looked up and I saw some of the ladies crying. And so I knew I reached them because they are also in certain places in their life because they won't take their meds and their mothers. And I, and I told them I was mad. I was mad at my mother for not taking medication. I was mad she wasn't, she didn't wear the little waist dresses and cook cookies and you know, like. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> I leave it to Beaver's mother. Yeah. She wasn't like that at all. No, like, no. like leave it to Beaver. <laughs> and no, I was mad. And that was the time when leave it to Beaver was yes. the one. Yes, yeah. still the, the 50s wife, you know, how yeah. they meet their husband at the door with a drink yeah. and how they're always perfect and the house is perfect. No, that wasn't my mother. And she didn't join any women's club. She wouldn't go to PTA. She didn't do any of those things you expect a mother to do. You know, the funny thing about it is that what, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And that, I think yeah. that applies here, too. I mean, it could have been really disastrous for you, Sharon, mm -hmm. but you came out of it. And I wrote the one word down that I, I told you before that I came away after reading your book. And it's the word survival. It, yeah. it made you survive it, it, and brought you now to a place where you have a successful book. You have a successful career. Oh, thank you. You have a successful family. You told me you have multiple <laughs> grandchildren all over the place. Yes. Things have worked out pretty well, haven't right. they? And when you asked me how I survived, I learned early on that life is a mind game. Oh, wow, you heard it here on Think Tank. Like, yeah, you just have to keep changing your mind, change your perspective about things, and things change. Yeah. You know, it comes from here. Yeah, that's, that's great. That's what I learned, too.